Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, August 12, 2020, Optimal Health Associates, COVID update. I'm going to be going through some data tonight having to do with immunology, so a little more complicated. I'll try to make it understandable. But as I'm not a professor of immunology, it's harder to make it understandable sometimes. Uh, just some basic statistics, though. We're, I think, at about 615 deaths in Oklahoma. We had another 755 cases, roughly, I think, yesterday and 600 and some today. Um, so our trend's a little bit better. It's not quite as good as I was hoping, but we just have to wait and see. Um, schools are opening. Uh, my best to all the teachers and students. Just remember, as you read data about people being in quarantine, like there was a report, I think, out of Georgia, 800 students are in quarantine. Well, that's okay. That doesn't mean they're sick. It doesn't mean anything. It just means they're in quarantine. They got exposed. Let's see what happens. It's a sign that the schools are doing their job. And one of the reasons that people go in quarantine in the first few days of school is, lo and behold, parents sorry and students but parents which is our central theme i think here that i'm uh, talking to people about is parents have a tendency to lie and if parents lie it screws up the whole plan don't be the physician's assistant who sends your kid to school with um, tylenol immediately before so that their fever isn't there don't be not one of ours not one of ours don't worry we're <laughs> But the point is, don't be the doctor who does that. Don't be just the normal person who does that. It's okay to miss work occasionally because of COVID right now. Um, so it's how it is. So let's make good choices to protect the whole community. Uh, I mean, there's do-gooders and then there's people who aren't as much do-gooders and we need more people to be do-gooders. So that's, that's one message. Let's talk about science though. And I'm going to mention briefly hydroxychloroquine. I'm not going to be talking that much about hydroxychloroquine the next, for the next week or two, because I would like some other data points to come out. We've kind of beat that horse to death, um, over the last several weeks to several months. And it's not that my opinion on it has changed at all. It's just, let's give some data a chance to mature, see what else happens. Because I think tonight's a great example of new data that's transcendently important. And I first did a written post about it. It's from the journal Science. Uh, Dr. Fauci actually talked about it today, which was both very positive and a little bit bewildering because this, so the journal Science, for those of you who are not mega nerds, and uh, and I want to be clear, people who read science a lot, the journal, um, are really often the smartest of the scientists type people. I mean, I don't read science, that journal. I will read it like today because of the article that came out if I hear about an article. But there are people who read it routinely because it is, I think, this probably the signature journal for research in the world. So one of the things that happened, or the thing that happened today, was the journal science article on immune immuno response to corona cold viruses came out what that study showed was that there is significant cross reactivity in patients who are unexposed to covid 19 who've had exposure to corona cold viruses or the mundane original source of COVID. And th that was data from several different countries, Germany, the UK, and I think a couple Norwegian uh, countries. Um, and it showed between a 20 and 50% cross reactivity in the T cells. And that means that when the epitope of the genetic sequence of the virus that is the part that the immune system reacts to was shown to the T cells of these patients, and this is a COVID epitope, who had never been exposed to COVID, their T cells reacted to it and had an immune response that could be very protective. And that makes sense because when you have cross reactivity of your T cells, it gives you immunity. So while we still need studies showing that it provides immunity, chances are it's going to provide immunity. It's the whole basis of why um, convalescent plasma works from patients who've had COVID to, not me, but if you have COVID and you donate your plasma, why you can help someone who 
uh, is in the throes of the infection. It's this whole what happens with your T cells and antibodies and all of that. So this is just absolutely fabulous news. I mean, I can't describe what a game changer this is to people because it shows that the antigens or proteins on the surface of our COVID model over here, somewhere, some of these proteins are registering in people who've never been exposed to COVID and they're mounting an immune response and that immune response is gonna be protective. Now we have to prove that a little bit more and do things to show that. But again, immunology is a science that's been around for a hundred years. And as I talked about Betta Stradler, who wrote about this about a month ago, and he said as the premier immunologist in Europe that we'd thrown out everything we knew about immunology when this virus started because we all got so nervous and that needed to stop. And immunology is immunology. We have a, people talk incorrectly, well, we need to get sick in order to have an immune response to protect us from COVID. That's not true, but what their point is, if you get exposed to things, you build up immunities across a panel of viruses. So saying that, oh, if you get exposed to COVID, that's gonna protect you, yes, if it doesn't kill you. And so right now, one of the things we were originally trying to do was figure out what this all fell into. So it turns out probably a lot of us are gonna have some immunity. Now, you don't wanna make a final decision on it. You still need to wear your mask. You gotta wear your mask, you gotta wash your hands. It's gonna be, and if you do have some immunity, it's gonna be partial, but we don't know yet. But this is great news, because it means as we get through this next year or so, we're gonna have some immunity almost always, which is what we would expect, and that's normal immunologic responses. So I think this is really, really important. It takes some of the fear away. We're not gonna have to keep on worrying, I bet, on, oh, I got the COVID-19, like Hugo did, my son. I'm not worried about him getting it again anytime in the next year. And I think he's gonna probably have some immunity for a few years. And again, we have to prove that, but we know from looking at the people who've had COVID, so far there isn't a documented reinfection in the world literature. Everything that's thought to be a reinfection has not been. So. There is an immune response to COVID. There's been immune responses to coronaviruses that were precedent or before COVID that are probably gonna give a little protection, which is why some people who get exposed don't seem to have a reaction to it, and other people in the same group do because they didn't have the prior exposure. So this takes a lot of the fear away because remember what we've been talking about for the last six months is, oh, we can't do anything, we're all gonna get it, and then we could all have no immune response and we could all die. Well, no, it's not as bad as that. Now we don't know who it's gonna be, but think that propels science in terms of A, helping develop a, a vaccine that will work. You know, that's really important. That's why, again, rushing vaccines is stupid because you want more data to develop an appropriate vaccine. And then two, it also is gonna inadvertently protect some people. We don't know who it will be, but I think we can be very positive about that data. The questions to ask yourself though, and I put this in my written post, is since this is not the first time this data has been published, it's one of multiple times, this one just kind of synthesizes it. And the prior authors who published some of this data were just excoriated across editorials and in journal articles and the scientific community why was that? Why was it not, oh, this is an opinion, this is research, let's figure it out. No, people were crucified for saying that there's gonna be some immunity and this is why and this is the data. What is that? Why has that happened? Why did mouthpieces for the federal government and all these doctors, and I mean doctors, PhDs and MDs and DOs, who are paid consultants by these big pharma companies, more than willing to go and excoriate people, in editorials without, without having to divulge their relationships. And why are these editorial boards at, in the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA and all these journal articles really kind of having some questionable scientific discovery? And even like if you look at the American College of Physicians, I said the wrong group, the American Academy of Surgeons and Physicians. The American College of Physicians, which is for the main, mainly for internal medicine doctors, um, why did they, again, come out so strongly against the drug that not, won't be named, citing research that's already been repudiated as the reason to come against it. I mean, I just continue to wonder about 
this. And I don't think it's politics at all. And for those of you who think this is political, I'm thinking this is more Big Pharma's influence and how its money permeates um, advertisements and journals. It's a huge thing. And the question is why, again, did it take Fauci this long to acknowledge it when this data has been present and is consistent with 100 years of immunologic knowledge and act like it it wasn't. And I just question, again, how many more things are we going to find out that once we apply science and a careful thought process versus reactivity and spasticity and crucifixion and the cancel culture, we're going to destroy anyone who argues against a narrative um, for various reasons. And the way to handle it isn't to do a debate scientifically or kindly but to just just try to destroy them. And so it becomes hard for people to be willing to step forward and write prescriptions for things or say, hey, I disagree scientifically, this isn't correct, or criticize a journal article like I've done. Um, and remember, when I'm criticizing journal articles, I am not a statistician. I mean, they have to have such obvious mistakes, it's frightening for me to kind of get them, at least reasonably obvious mistakes to someone who reads journal articles all the time. So, but I'm not a statistician. It's not, that isn't how I'm looking at them. It's just common sense of errors that you would never do. And so when journal articles have them, and I can see them, they're obvious. And whereas when you read these journal articles that don't have anything and they have good science behind them and good statistics, yet people are criticizing them and take little comments to the authors that are more personal, like, well, his subspecialty is X and why would he know this? Or her subspecialty is she has a degree, a PhD in immuno immunologic develop issues in bacteria. Why is she writing about viruses? Well, because there's cross knowledge and all these things. So I think that's our key concept tonight is there's going to be more scientific data that comes out across all parts of COVID that's going to reverse a lot of what's going on now. And we just need to be patient and see what happens. And when those cards fall where they may, there needs to be an accounting at some level. I doubt there will be, but an accounting at editorial boards in the United States and in Europe for these journals. Um, the scientists who write these or MDs or PhDs or DOs who write these um, editorials that are not based on good science or good statistics yet um, are published and they are paid consultants by companies. I think that just all needs to, at some point, be evaluated, um, maybe even legislated. And I think the other thing all of us need to realize is the long and the short of this is going to end up changing our healthcare system, probably for the worse. And what will happen is we may end up with a one-payer system and all that stuff is the solution to COVID. When the problem was the government messed this up from the beginning and then paid consultants and two physicians, I want to emphasize, unfortunately, could affect data. So enough of that. Kim, am I forgetting anything? You had a question or two tonight. Um, yeah, there was just a couple. Um, do you think, does UV sanitizer lights kill COVID? Yes, if they're the right wavelength, but yes, UV sanitizer lights do. And interesting enough, as I told many, uh, or many of you heard me say months and months ago, when, <laughs> It's funny, but when Trump said you could put something in the body to uh, eradicate COVID, it's actually you can eradicate COVID in the colon with a UV probe. Not that, I don't know why anyone would do that. Don't do this at home. <laughs> don't do this at home. And I don't know why that, why that technique would be germane to anyone. But when he said you could do something internally to eradicate it, you can. It's just not really all that pragmatic. <laughs> So I don't even I want to contemplate that. So whatever. But it, it UV light applied to surfaces kills COVID and other viruses too. Um, let's see. And then somebody asked, else asked about low levels of vitamin D. Um, there, it looks like some studies are showing that if you have low vitamin D and you get the virus, it's more likely to be severe. You're more likely yes. to get hospitalized. So we've gone over vitamin D for a, a long time. This is the rules of thumb with vitamin D. Low vitamin D increases or decreases your immune system and makes your body not function well. There's more than 2,000 different pathways for vitamin D. 
So lower vitamin D equals lower immunity. Lower vitamin D equals much greater cancer. Lower vitamin D doubles your risk for cardiovascular events. Lower vitamin D causes osteoporosis. Lower vitamin D is incredibly bad for you. So we've always wanted people on vitamin D. 5,000 units is just the average dose. That usually gets people, if they're taking it with food or an oil or a fat, into a good range. But immune function, immune function, immune function, immune function. You want vitamin D with your zinc and with your multivitamin. We want the fish oil because of the microembolic disease, which again, I wrote a little post about um, oral estrogen is a potential problem right now in a very older or older fashion birth control pill called a Nuva Ring, very specifically only the Nuva Ring, only the Nuva Ring, no other form of vaginal estrogen is what I'm talking about. Nuva Rings only in oral estrogen increase thrombotic events mildly in people. And so if you're on one of those and you get COVID and there's a massive elevation in thromboembolic disease, you don't want anything that would make it worse. Likewise, if you have any of the classic thromboembolic risk factors, which means you have some metabolic stuff that could be very harmful, you have a Leiden factor five mutation, a prothrombin um, mutation, you have uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. I just say that because it took me 10 years, so it makes me sound smart. But MTHFR, you have uh, two autosomal recessives or potentially an autosomal recessive with a variant. And your homocysteine's elevated. You have anti-cardiolipin antibodies. You have antiphospholipin antibodies. Um, I'm sure I'm missing one or two major clotting disorders in terms of elevating blood clot risk. Um, but those are the most common. If you get COVID, you really need to be thinking about, am I going to have a thrombosis? Because COVID facilitates thrombosis even in a mild patient. So you need to contact your doctors or providers to let them know that, hey, I have COVID and I have a, a disease that elevates the risk for clotting. What do I need to do? Do I need fish oil? Do I need a baby ass? Or what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? If you're already on a blood thinner, you don't need to worry about it. But again, talk to your doctors. And, and when I'm saying talk to your doctors, I'm a doctor, so I'm dumb and I say doctor all the time, but really it's your providers. There's absolutely fabulous PAs, nurse practitioners, nurse clinicians that take care of millions of patients in this country and they're very smart and they can handle it. They just have to sometimes do a little research like I do. It's not like I, this is spontaneous knowledge. I have to read and stuff. Like I have to, I had to look up the word epitope in order to describe what that was tonight because I was like, epitope, I know it has to do with antigen, but what is it? It's not de novo knowledge. You have to research as a provider to be up to date. So enough of that. Have a great day. Take your vitamins. Be safe. Drive carefully. Remember, driving is still the most dangerous thing we do every day. So take care and good night.